My name is Ilona. Um, I'm a senior volunteer here. This course is informed through my own personal experiences, the mentorship that I received from other senior volunteers, which I'm very grateful for, from my own personal failings, having made mistakes previously, and from the Maddie's Fun Shelter Dog Handling course, which I'm happy to share with everyone after today's um, class. Um, as I was discussing before you all got here, one of the main differences between our dogs at home and the dogs in the shelter is that the shelter dogs are experiencing probably high levels of stress from their various experiences. That makes them behave differently and react to stimulus differently. It also means our approach has to be very analytical in order to be safe. A lot of the approaches that we're gonna to discuss today are first assessing from a safe distance and then sort of continually assessing behavior and responses to our own approaches in order to maintain safety. First and foremost, I want you guys to be super safe. Secondarily, our role as volunteers is, it's really to help the dogs find a level of de-stress because this is, you know, this sucks for them, right? Like some of them, this might be a step up from their previous experiences, but thankfully that's, that's just a few of them, right? For most of them, this is tough. This is, they've left a home and are coming here, right? So when a dog is highly stressed, it's, sympathetic nervous system responses are going to be elevated, which is very similar to in humans. When we are very stressed, maybe our voice gets a little higher. Maybe our shoulders get a little tighter. Maybe we're a little like snappier, quicker to respond. And you may see that in a lot of shelter dogs. I see oftentimes volunteers getting really frustrated with dogs that can be continuously sort of jumpy, right? Which is a really frustrating scenario and we're gonna talk about how to deal with that. Oftentimes that's just a young dog's response to stress. And so we have to find a place to be able to bring that stress level down. Um, I actually, I updated this course as I've taught it previously and added in um, some research that I really found uh, a couple shelters in Detroit are actually doing some really cool research on shelter stress in general. Um, and they found that just a 45 minute interaction with a volunteer, even if it didn't include any training or anything specific, decreased a dog's stress levels for up to three days, which is pretty awesome. They're measuring stress as a, they're measuring cortisol levels in a dog's saliva as an indicator of stress, which is a pretty close indicator for both animals and humans, right? Um, so I think that's really cool, looking at the just the simplicity of our interactions with each dog and having that carry over to potentially, I mean, for the dogs that we interact with today, if they have an interaction with a potential adopter later today, they might be approaching that interaction with less stress, they may feel a little bit more at ease, they might be like, oh, those volunteers smiled at me. They let me do my thing. Um, so please keep that in mind. Your time here matters. It matters not just the time that you're spending in the building, but it can really impact these, these dogs for long periods of time. I mean, think about if each one of us had the opportunity to interact with the same dog over the course of multiple weeks, how much more improved would that dog's life be? Um, and that's not only increasing the chance of them getting adopted, but it's also decreasing their chance of, of developing these really stress-based behaviors in the kennel, right? L less risk that they're gonna be jumping, less risk that they're gonna be tearing a dew claw or something like that that can come from stress, that can come from repeated, maybe lunging at the door of the kennel. Um, and then also, we have had a lot of really serious disease outbreaks, as have a lot of shelters around the country. Um, and, you know, we're finding out that dogs who are at increased levels of stress, their immune systems are just so compromised. So if there's anything that we can do to help decrease their stress levels while they're here in the shelter, that's awesome. We could actually help them build up resistance to some level of, of illness, to contracting an illness. Um, and then hopefully they have an increased chance of, of getting out. First page 
um, is Boogie the Boston Terrier, doggy language. You guys have probably seen this. I love Lily Chin's illustrations. She's fantastic. Um, I like these illustrations because I think they're a very exaggerated version of all of these various doggy language um, aspects. I have this in my fridge and have had it since I took like puppy class with my dog, I think six or seven years ago. Um, it's a great reference point. Now, it might not, stress levels, happiness, joy might not look exactly the same in each dog. They might not even look the same in each dog of each breed because all dogs are individuals. But this is a basic guideline and I think that looking for some of these outward signs of inward feelings is a really good practice for all of us because it gives us a chance to tap into the dogs that we're working with on a regular basis and start the communication that is really gonna be essential to you all staying safe, to the dog staying safe, having a great experience when they're walked with a volunteer, you're gonna flip over. So bypass page, the front side of page one because that page got cut off. That's why you have a larger picture of Boogie, but that's fine, because then you can put it on your fridge like I did with mine. You're gonna go to the page, which is the back side of page two, which says calm and relaxed or shut down. Um, this page is really important. I think a lot of people kind of glance over this and they go, I know this. I have, this is the third time I've taught this class and I've gone over this in every class prior to this. And in every class prior to this, I bring out a shy or scared dog and I ask people which of these two it is and half of the class gets it wrong. So notice that there's a difference between these two dogs. Belly rubs is not always the reason that the dog is rolling over on its back. And introducing belly rubs to a shy, scared, or shut down dog is oftentimes reinforcing their fear and putting you at risk for a bite, which I, I mean, I say that a lot, but more, than, more likely than not, you're not gonna get bit. But observe the dog's behavior so that you don't put yourself at any risk of being bitten, and so you don't reinforce the fear that they might already have of big scary human with a leash. Maybe they're not familiar with being leashed. Maybe they've never had a leash walk in their life. Um, we're gonna go over, on the next page, you can flip over to just some general safety guidelines. These are things that you all are probably already doing, so we won't, won't go over it for too much. Do carry a volunteer radio with you at all times. That's especially more important now that we do not have unlimited access in and out of the building. <laughs> That's it's also a safety measure. Um, channel three is what they use for general communication. Um, this I'm going down the do side. Do carry treats with you at all times. This is non-negotiable. There are treats in the volunteer room. There are treats by the doorway just between um, dog holding and room three. Um, the reason that we carry treats with us is that it is a very easy redirection if behavior regresses. Meaning, it is really, really easy to toss a treat if you want a dog to go another way. We're gonna go over when that doesn't work, you know, which there will be times when that doesn't work. But first of all, you wanna be able to have another way to sort of move the dog away from you if you need to. Um, do always grab the leash firmly in your hand with a loop around your wrist and fingers clasping the lead. Um, this, is, this is a harness lead. Um, there are multiple harness leads available in the volunteer office that you can just check out and we're gonna go over how to use it as a harness later today. A harness is not essential for all dogs, but it is um, definitely recommended for dogs that are a flight risk. We're gonna work with one of the dogs that's, I haven't walked him yet, but he's noted flight risk on his kennel and kind of excited to take him out today. Um, we're gonna work on putting a harness on various dogs. It's a safer way to do it. Also dogs with like smush faces, much safer way to walk them. You definitely don't wanna be cutting off any airway for a dog that already has limited air intake. It can put them in a, a state of panic, right? Um, so holding the lead, this is definitely the safest way to go about it. I do see people kind of holding it like it's 
like a cute purse. And this is a really easy way to lose a dog. <laughs> um, goes around your wrist and then you clasp. I actually have a couple knots in my lead which allow me to use my other hand to move the dog around. Um, this is a really secure grip. This is not gonna come out. I have had, I've attended other shelter handling courses where they instructed like a thumb loop and then you sort of like loop your fingers around. Anatomically, that doesn't make sense to me um, because I can, get, yeah, I can, I can get out of it. My thumb is not as strong as my wrist, right? Um, my wrist plus my fingers is a really, really nice strong grip and you'll need it. There are a lot of really big dogs here. There are dogs that are stressed. There are dogs that are pulling, right? And for a little bit, you know, we are gonna work on pulling and how to, how to manage it. But initially when you get out the door, they're gonna pull you, they gotta pee, right? Most of these dogs have already been house trained. You notice because they go out the door and then they pee right away or they're pulling you really hard until they poop. They've probably had some previous house training. A lot of these dogs have. Um, and, and so, you know, preventing them from pulling is really unrealistic. Um, managing the pulling is, is, is our goal. Managing the pulling so they can pull safely, the leash stays in your hand, nobody's getting pulled down. Um, on the don't side of this third page, don't reach toward a dog that you haven't met yet or one that you know is fearful. Everyone, um, <laughs> I, 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 everyone's instinct for new dogs is this, right? How many times have you seen this? Like everyone does this. This can be terrifying for a dog that doesn't know you. They don't know what you're gonna do with this hand. Maybe they have had bad experiences with hands coming toward them. Even if you're a super nice person, right? Even if your body language is great, don't reach toward the dog. If they want to approach you, they will approach you. And we're going to give them the autonomy to approach you if they want to because allowing them autonomy builds confidence, right? And confidence is key to managing stress, which is key to minimizing bite risks, which is key to increasing their levels of adaptability. Um, don't cower over dog. Yes, Olivia. Doesn't matter. Yep, great question. I love it. Treat, 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 treat. It looks the same. And it also then becomes potentially a conflict. So let's imagine scared dog. In this example, this would be the dog that's maybe on this second side of the back side of page two, the dog that is shut down, tucked in, ears kind of out wide and down, a dog that's fearful, a dog that's experiencing high levels of stress. You approach with a treat. They want the treat, but they're scared of you. They're gonna approach, they might take the treat. You might assume that them taking a treat is an invitation to reach and pet, right? They're closer to you, they did approach you, but maybe they just approached for the treat, right? So I love that question, that's perfect, thank you. Did I ask you to ask that before class? No. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a conflict going on there. We don't wanna to have to put a scared dog in that place of conflict. As soon as we recognize the fearful body language, we're not gonna coerce, like, coerce them into trying to come toward us. Sure, the treat might make them feel better about us, right? But you know what would really make them feel better? Let's say they're back over there and we just like toss a treat and then we stand back here, we're chill. We're non-threatening. Maybe we even like kind of angle body away. This is non-threatening, right? Or maybe we even like, we don't look at them. I'm just gonna look out the window. Treats over there, you can take it if you want, I don't care. That's really non-threatening, right? Some of the dogs that you'll encounter are going to need the second level, that level of I'm looking away, I'm making myself smaller, I'm angling away, I am indicating in every way possible I am not a threat to you plus that treat's over there, and there are no contingencies to that treat, right? The contingency is not you have to approach, sorry, James. 
Uh, the contingency is not you have to approach me in order to get your food, but instead it's you can have that food and I'm just gonna be here. And then when you wanna come chill with me, you can come chill with me. Um, and I know that sounds wild, but it does work. It really does. Um, and it takes a little bit more time, but there are some dogs the amount of time that it takes is the amount of time that it takes. And you have to, going into every volunteer shift, sort of have that conversation with yourself as to how much time you have set out for your volunteer shift. And if you see a dog that's crouched all the way back in the back of the corner in the kennel and, you know, they sort of, you know, the ears looked a little when you walk by, but they're not, you know, they're not really engaging with you. They're more tried, they're more avoidant. They're, they're looking over there at the wall, at the corner of the wall. Um, so you have to make that decision. Do I feel comfortable taking the time to maybe sit outside of this dog's kennel, angle my body away, glance off in the distance and sort of just keep tossing treats in there? Do I wanna take the time to let them maybe come a little closer, maybe even sniff my shoulder through the kennel door? Maybe understanding via that sniff that all I do is smell like treats and dogs and maybe not a threat. Um, and that's up to you. I'm not gonna, nobody has to interact with any dog they don't feel comfortable interacting with. Um, but if you do take the time to do it, I think it can be a really, really amazing confidence boosting exercise for yourselves and then also for, um, also for the dogs, you know, to see, I mean, I've. I can remember um, one dog that I'm specifically thinking about that, you know, she was tough. She didn't get many walks because she stood in the back of her corner, or the back of her kennel, and it wasn't just that she was shut down, she was also proactively trying to avoid people coming in. She was barking, she was growling, she was baring her teeth a little bit. I, I wanted to know her because this was her second time at the shelter. I had recognized that she had been here and were adopted and then returned. And so I wanted to take the time to get to know her. The first two times we went outside, we did not interact. I didn't touch her. I let her kind of leash herself. I'll show you how to do that. Dangling a lead. If they want to go outside, they can put their head in. Great, awesome, cool. We go outside, I don't touch her. I took her out to the, the run in the field, tossed a bunch of treats, she sniffed around. We didn't do a lot of interaction. On my third visit, my third visit, she approached me while I had her off leash in the kennel. And she nudged me and I did a little consent test, which we will go over shortly, which is an opportunity to sort of ask the dog, do you want to be petted? This is great for feel fearful dogs. This is not assuming that you can enter their space. It's asking for permission. It's recognizing their bodily autonomy. I know this is kind of wild, right? Um, recognizing the dogs have bodily autonomy, but they do and allowing them to have that bodily autonomy, allowing them to say, this is my body, I don't wanna to be touched right now, or I don't wanna be touched there, is so helpful for building that relationship. So you can have a safe walk with them, so you can have a safe interaction, so that they can go into their next interaction, maybe with a potential adopter, or a foster, or a rescue, and they'll say, I felt respected, you know? I kinda of know, like, you know, I feel better, I feel more confident about myself. Um, so in the third visit, this dog crawled into my lap and licked my face. Going from barking, growling in the back of her kennel, like ears totally flattened to her head, whale eye, so much white around the eye, so much, um, to third visit, crawling my lap and licking my face. That is a beautiful process. And not every dog gets there in that same timeline. Some take longer. Some might not get there while they're here, but Giving them the chance is really, really cool. And this method of allowing them some autonomy of choice in the way that they're touched, the way that they're approached, is definitely going to help you become more confident in your handling skills and definitely um, help keep you safe. This last one, I always say <laughs> that I laugh because I put this on here, don't hug a dog or put your face in their face. And yet I continuously do this um, I break my own rules all the time. That one, I will just say, always enter with the assumption that you're not going to put your face in another dog, in a dog's face, although you'll know when they allow you to. 
And if you get some kisses as a result of it, it's a beautiful thing. Um, on the, yeah. Yes, of course. So I like what you're saying mm -hmm. about, you know, taking your time with, with the dogs. Mm -hmm. I think like one of the challenges I've had is since I've come here, I'll be like the only one there. And there's like so totally dogs that yep. you know, you're like going to be efficient so yep. and get this full room walk. Yep. Or am I going to have like a... What's your name? Beth. Beth. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Um, I totally, I hear you. I totally hear you. It is absolutely tricky, and I wish I had an easy answer for it. I really don't. Um, I would absolutely love it if we were all walking at the same time, and we had a beautiful routine, and we had, like, I'm doing kennels X through X, and you're doing kennels X through X, and we all sort of kind of have this nice visual going, and we can keep a good distance outside with the leads. We are not at that place yet, and oftentimes I'm coming in and I'm the same as you. I, I, you know, it's like I'll be the only person here. Uh, it's hard to get in and out now. Um, I will say make that determination for yourself. And you might even have to make that determination for yourself based on how you're feeling that day. Like there are some days when I come in and like emotionally, I, I might just be in a place where I need to walk as many dogs as possible, right? And, and I have to recognize that about myself after the experience of being here for a while and knowing my needs as well as the dog's needs, um, then there might also be those days when you meet that one dog and you just kind of want to spend that time with them. Um, I, I don't have an answer for it because honestly, we're all volunteers. We're, we're taking, yes. Yeah, 100%. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I know I'm the only one here, so my yeah. thing is I try to rotate. I do a big dog, a yep. small dog. I awesome. Try, try to give me attention. So some days I might not get that same dog that's attached to me. Yeah. I try not to get too attached, but I know they yeah. want me to walk them, so I know I just walked them yesterday. I'm yeah. Walking. You're Dwayne, right? Yeah. yeah. I walk, so I try to give them my next day I come in. So I, that works. 100%. Yeah. And, like, those are different approaches, right? And I know Beth, you're sort of on the fence about it, right? But I, I, I don't. There isn't a right way, right? You, you honestly can. It it is unrealistic to imagine that every dog in this facility is walked on a daily basis. I know that that is a goal that the new director has. It is unrealistic to imagine that that's happening. Realistically, you are volunteers. You are spending your time, and. I think that however you want to approach it, even if that changes on a weekly basis, it's totally fine. I, I tend to err on Dwayne's side at, when I do come in for the most part and try and get dogs out that I know haven't had the chance to be walked um, recently. For me, that tends in the direction of walking the dogs in the restricted room that I have to call for on the radio, which if... I don't know Marilyn's process for approving senior volunteers, but if you are interested in doing that, please discuss this with her because it, it the since volunteers can't enter that room, those dogs are not walked as frequently. Um, that doesn't mean that that has to be everyone's process, though. It's just been my approach in the past, and there are some days when I come in and I'm like, I'm walking dogs in room three. <laughs> I'm going to get every dog in room three out that I can walk that aren't humane holes, and. Uh, and, and that's what just feels like that's, that's right for that day. But it doesn't have to be that. Um, and it can vary based on how you're feeling and your physical capacity too. If you're not feeling up to walking, you know, 17 large dogs that pull, it's okay to say, I'm going to take out this elderly beagle and spend an hour with them. It makes a difference for that dog, right? Yes. Yep, so that's that's not current. That's subject to change. Um, as of right now, you are not limited to one room. But, yeah. Um, so as of very currently, um, and probably not helpful for whoever reviews this video afterwards, yeah. Um, 
yeah, after afterwards, it'll be, uh, you know, it'll kind of, it might change as we have had various outbreaks and this changes pretty much every time we have an outbreak. As of right now, the sickest dogs are in dog isolation. In order to enter dog isolation, you have to be suited up in full PPE. As of right now, none of us can use, can walk the dogs in dog isolation. Um, and that's the room between the bathrooms outside of restricted and just on the back side of the building where room between room two and the back side of the building. That's dog isolation. Or I guess the other way to say it is between dog holding and the and the bathrooms. Um, yeah. Um, senior volunteers, which again, this is a process that you'll discuss with Marilyn, but this class is a part of becoming a senior volunteer. Um, they are the only volunteers that can walk the dogs labeled pit bull mixes or terrier mixes in any room. The only reason for that is because of the breed specific legislation in Prince George's County, Maryland. It is not because of any inherent behavioral characteristic of a dog that has been labeled pit bull mix or pit bull terrier mix. Um, however, that is the only relevance in terms of noticing the breed marker on the cage card. Um, the other things that are indicated on the cage card that are relevant are if the dog is under a humane hold, we are not able to walk that dog. No volunteer at any level can walk a dog that is under humane hold, and that's because they are part of a pending case, a court case or an ACC case. Um, ACC hold is the same or is the similar marker. We can't walk those dogs, and it's because they're technically, from a legal standpoint, they're evidence. Um, yeah, we can walk dogs that are now on stray hold, so if their intake date was one or two days prior, we can do that. However, keep in mind that when the intake date says yesterday, that dog might be extra scared, they might be extra wired, they might be very unfamiliar with someone walking toward them with a leash. So that's the relevance of looking at the intake date. You can still walk that dog, but you wanna notice, oh, okay, this dog came in yesterday, right? There's actually a dog that came in yesterday that's in dog holding that I, I, I am, I would like for us to meet. I followed her story on the lost dogs page. I saw she was found uh, leashed to a tree. So I'm very curious to meet her and I, I'm not gonna put any extra pressure on her. When we do meet her, she, I, I looked in on her kennel, she looked really shy. So dog holding is one of the rooms that is limited to senior volunteers. Um, that's the room between room three and, room, and dog isolation. Dog isolation is intended for dogs that are sick and receiving treatment. At this present time, we can't go in that room. Previously, we've been able to um, and restricted. We are still not able to go into restricted as we have been in the past, but we can radio for a dog that is in restricted. And I'll go over that process with you all today. Um, walking a dog housed in the restricted room. Um, Marilyn is gonna send out a dog walking list weekly to all of the volunteers. On that list will be kennel numbers, which is really especially relevant because when you call for a caretaker to bring you a dog, you have to know where, what kennel that dog is in. Um, the rate, use the radio set to channel three to call for a caretaker to bring you a dog from restricted, specify which door you're at, otherwise they'll get very angry at you. Um, for example, can an available caretaker please meet me outside of restricted nearest the bathrooms? Give the caretaker your leash and specify which dog you want them to get. For example, please bring me Diesel in 86. The reason I use the, the name Diesel is there somehow happens to always be a Diesel here. <laughs> and it's always a gray and white pit bull type dog. Um, all right, greeting a leash dog outside of the kennel. This is kind of a unique situation that is because of our limited access to the room restricted, um, but I think it's especially relevant. When you're greeting a leashed dog, it's a little different because you can't assess their behavior through the kennel as we're gonna go over in the other rooms. So you kind of, you don't know what you're getting, but it's important, right? Because if you're getting a dog that's scared of strangers, you are a stranger to that dog. And that's not an uncommon thing, right? Dogs scared of strangers, or maybe it's a dog scared of strangers that are wearing fanny packs. Maybe it's a dog scared of strangers that are white women with black t-shirts that uh, happen to have their hair up in a ponytail. It doesn't matter. Maybe it's any stranger who's, hey, 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 hey. I mean, that's terrifying to me, but um, 
Most importantly, <laughs> yeah, most importantly, as the dog comes out of restrict, can I move over here? Yeah. As the dog comes out of restricted, I want you to stand to one side of the door. So I do not want you to stand directly in front of the door to wait for the dog. And that's because the dog is gonna come out, boom, fast and hot, because they have to use the bathroom right now, right now, right now. And they're excited. This is the first time they've seen anything outside of their kennel for, let's be honest, maybe a week, we don't know, four days, three days, two days, even 24 hours and a walk is still exciting, right? My dog gets a walk three times a day and he still greets me at the door like that. So um, yeah, angle your body slight, slightly away from the dog. So you're stepping to one side of the door, it's double doors and restricted, right? And the door on the right-hand side is the one that opens. So you're either gonna come over to this side of the door or you're gonna come over to this side of the door and you're gonna angle slightly away. And the reason being is that you squaring off to a dog is, can be perceived as threatening. Doesn't matter if you're a large or small person, it can still be perceived as threatening. Don't reach toward the dog. The dog's already on your leash because you handed your leash toward the, to the caretaker. You do not have to reach toward the dog. You're just gonna grab the leash from the caretaker and then you're gonna hustle your butt outside quickly and because they're gonna take you there for the most part. Some of them are gonna be fearful and they're gonna you know, crouch down and they're just gonna hang out there in the corner and you're gonna have to be patient and work them outside. But most of the dogs are going to zoom outside and then the unneutered boys will mark the hallway all the way down as you try to go outside, which is fine. We can clean it up later. Um, if the dog jumps on you, which they might, maybe they're excited to see you, maybe they're a little scared of you and they wanna sort of like, you know, see what's up. Maybe they're checking you out. Don't worry about it. It's fine, keep moving. You don't have to off, you don't have to down, because they're not going to hear you anyways. They will, it will not sink in. Off and down are fabulous for your dog that you have trained to do off and down. For dogs, even if they have had that experience of prior training that are so stimulated that they are in that sympathetic nervous system that they are fight or flight, they won't hear you. They won't, will not be able physically to acknowledge you. So continuously moving confidently outside is really the best way to go. Even if the dog continues to jump, if it does, it's, it's okay. Your shoulder's at the dog, right? You can angle your body toward them. So they're just kind of coming up here on the shoulder. It's not that big of a deal. Um, it's not ideal, but it's better if you get outside where their stress levels can come down, because outside is a lot less stressful than being anywhere in these hallways and hearing all the other dogs barking. Um, all right, moving on. So walking a dog housed in dog holding, dog ISO rooms, one through three, or quiet room. Um, so the normal, the normal walking that you all have been doing. Um, the beauty of being able to leash a dog up in the kennel is that you can assess their body language first, which I would definitely recommend taking the time to do that um, because it gives you a lot of information as to how to approach the dog, how to safely approach the dog, how to interact with that dog. Um, Take the time to just pause at the kennel. Even if they're like jumping up at the kennel, they're ready to go. Take the time to pause and just say, okay, what are we looking at? Feed them treats through the door. This is another reason we have a lot of treats. Feed them treats through the door. How are they taking the treat? Is it like, I've got a lot of whale eye and I'm sort of leaning forward and I want the treat, but I'm not quite sure all my weight's in my back legs. That's a dog that you're going to go slowly with. Even if they're right there at the kennel door, even if they're taking a treat. If they're taking treats hard and fast. Have you ever had a dog that takes treats like a dinosaur? I have news for you. They might not always take treats like a dinosaur. Maybe they do, but maybe they're just super, super excited and they just wanna go, they just wanna go. Or maybe, they're actually kind of scared. And they want to get in there and get out, which is another reason that extending your hand toward them with a treat is not really the best way to do it. Um, do you notice any of those signs? As you're approaching the dog, as you're assessing the behavior through the kennel, do you notice any of those signs that we noticed or that we were observing on the first page? So the boogie, the Boston Terrier. Do you notice whale eye? Are they giving you, can you see the whites of their eyes? Um, are they loading all their weight in their back feet? Even if a dog is right up, right up here, I'm gonna do this to Sarah, sorry. 
but they're, but they're back here. They're not really bought into that interaction with Sarah. They don't really trust her yet, right? They're not really able to trust you yet. So that would still be a dog that I would go slowly with, even to the extent where maybe I'd take some extra time feeding them treats through the door before I just stick my hand in there with a leash. Um, if they're taking treats tentatively or not at all, this is one of those dogs that Beth was sort of asking about, do we take the time? Um, it's up to you. I would not proceed to enter the kennel with a dog that's not taking treats unless I saw a change or a transition in their body language. So if the body language remained static, if they remained shut down, if they remained curled up at the back of the, the kennel, and I'm tossing them treats and they're just ignoring, they're looking anywhere other than me, I decide to sit calmly outside the kennel, I'm hoping they're gonna come over and sniff, maybe be a little curious. Curious is great. Curious is the beginning of a relationship because curiosity you could build on. You can say, okay, if you're curious about me, I'm gonna prove to you I can be trusted. But if they're not yet curious, if they're not able to be curious about you, that's something that I want you to you know, really think about. Do I, do I have the time to take with this dog? Um, maybe your first couple interactions are just you sitting outside of the kennel the first couple of times you see them. Or maybe, you decide, okay, well, what, what happens if I unlock the kennel? Um, rules for unlocking the kennel, by the way. The kennels open out, they do not open in. Get your head out of the way of the kennel door, always. Um, I have personally had the experience of being smacked in the face with a kennel door with a dog that I didn't, that, that was at the far back of the kennel and then all of a sudden was not, was right up there banging that door open. So everyone wants to unlock the kennel door from a standing position, leaning over, so your head is like right in front of the kennel door, um, unlocking here. I'm gonna teach you how to unlock the kennel door with your foot blocking so the door cannot open past a certain point and your weight in your back leg so that your head is behind the kennel door. And that is for your own safety. It is because I have been hit really hard in the face, and I do not want any of you to be hit really hard in the face because it really hurts, especially when it's a very large husky. It really hurts, okay? Um, so maybe with that scared dog, maybe you're gonna go back and you're gonna see how they feel about you unlocking that door safely with the, the foot there to, for security. The goal isn't necessarily for you to go in just yet, but maybe you wanna see, do they respond to the, does the head lift up? Are they curious now? or maybe they just stay there. Um, that's your option. You don't have to pursue that. Um, but if you want to spend the time with that dog, that dog obviously could benefit from having more time spent. Um, have you noticed, have, are you all members of the Facebook group, the volunteer Facebook group, right? Um, if you are not members of the volunteer Facebook group and you have a Facebook account, which I know I have to preface, uh, Marilyn does list between six and like 10 dogs every week that they have identified on their walkthroughs are in need of some additional volunteer time. And it's recommended that senior volunteers only interact with them. These are great opportunities to start building your confidence with dogs that might be slightly shut down, might be extra fearful, or maybe are on the other end of the spectrum, of the stress spectrum, maybe they're hyper, maybe they're jumping up on their kennel. Maybe they're like that husky that was in one that I don't think is there anymore, who would like actually jump on her kennel and like stand on the sides, the concrete block sides of the bunny. Did you all meet her? It was an appropriate name. It was really cute. Yeah, she was, yeah, she would stand on the kennel. So you're like, you'd look and you're like, there's no dog here. And then she's like standing up there. Um, yeah, so that's a stress dog and that's a different type of stress dog. So this is a good way, if you do have a Facebook account, join the volunteer group, you can keep tabs of those dogs and then make it a point. If I do wanna see that dog, maybe you're visiting them at the beginning of your volunteer shift, maybe that specifically because that dog might take a little bit more time um, or maybe not. Maybe it's just, you know, maybe that's what you do with your volunteer shift is you just spend a lot of time with one of those dogs. Again, that's up to you. Um, 
So if you approach the kennel and you're observing some of that fearful or shut down body language, proceed with caution, move slowly, be very aware of your own body language because it is impacting the dog that you're interacting with. Their view is basically like these four sides, the wall behind them, and you. That's it. And they've already had so much exposure to these walls and the wall behind them that those are no longer really, they're just like muted at this point. So it's basically their entire world is you. That's why your body language matters so much. That's why you ha have an opportunity to have so much of an impact based on how you proceed with that dog. If they are fearful, crouch or kneel down to open the kennel, leash them up through the open kennel door. Use the foot opposite of your leash hand. This is unhelpful because this door opens right away. Oh, I'm gonna do it over here. James, can you, is that okay? All right. So, I'm modifying this slightly because I'm gonna show you in the kennels themselves, obviously but I wanna get the audio of being able to show you here. Uh, all, right. all right, kennel door. It's gonna to open toward me. Foot goes here. This is not enough distance for a dog to come out, right? I have to push down with this foot because I definitely don't want them to take me out here, right? That's, then you're really in a mess. Then your head's right in front of them like you're in a split, it sucks. Um, your head has to be back here. Otherwise, if you're here unlocking the kennel door, they can jump on the door and smack you. They probably won't, but you know, it could happen. Um, the approach for shy and fearful dogs, I would recommend if you're comfortable kneeling, if you're physically able to kneel, I like a kneel because you're, you're making your space smaller. You are non-threatening to them in a lot of ways. And also you have a lot of control over what that leash does. They're shy. They're kind of sinking back from you anyways. You have an opportunity here to, to show them I recognize that, I see what you're doing. I like this. If you're not physically able to kneel, a slightly crouched position, bending your knees, lowering your torso, I'm not saying lean forward, because again, then you're putting your head at risk of getting hit. Um, and you also could look even more intimidating if you're physically leaning over top of the dog. But crouching down slightly can minimize your physical presence, help show them that you understand that they're scared. And I open it much larger than their head, but not large enough for their legs to slip through, which is obviously, you know, some of them can still do it. And I offer it for dogs that are experienced with being leashed. A lot of dogs will put their own head through it because they want to go outside. And it's a great invitation, right? It's like saying, hey, we can go outside if you want. There's no pressure. I'm not forcing them to get leashed. Um, if they're thinking about it, but they're not quite ready, I'll see if, if they're taking the treats out that I'm tossing to them off the floor, maybe I'll offer them a treat in my, the same hand as the, 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 the leg that's blocking the door, maybe I'll offer that here. And then I'm luring their head through, physically luring their head through. So I can dangle here. I'm gonna lure the head through. Okay, great. I let that go, right? So they're nice on a cinch leash. And then I'm gonna take them on the side of my body that is outside of the kennels. This is not always possible because in room three, obviously there are kennels on both sides, right? In the center aisle ways of rooms one and two, there are two kennels that face each, or there are two aisles that face each other. But if you are on the outside and you're able to put them on the wall side, away from other dogs, walk them on that side of your body so that the kennels would be here and you're trying to bring them away. And to avoid cage fighting, but also just like it's stressful, right? A million dogs are barking at you as you take this one dog out. If you can do any slight thing to minimize the stress, to put yourself between this dog and more potentially stressed dogs, the better. Move quickly to go outside, super quick. And then before you hit the aisle, and this is something I'm trying to start and no one's doing it yet, but I would love to see it. Just yell, hey, I'm coming out, or anything. Has, has anyone waited tables? Yeah, okay, Nancy. Um, so like I did briefly and I was terrible at it, but uh, the one thing I always remember is you yell corner before you come out the corner. You can say corner if you want to, Everyone kind of understands what that means. And at the very least, if you don't, 
they hear a human voice and they're like, ah, there's someone over there. The worst possible thing would, you be, would be that you walk around the corner with a stressed dog and someone else is in front of you with a stressed dog and you have an altercation that is purely just because you are decreasing the amount of space in between those very stressed dogs too rapidly and it is at a heightened risk of having a potentially bad altercation. Or, you know, the other bad thing would be you walk around the corner and there's like a group of school children or something like that with a stressed dog. Definitely don't want to do that. Yes? Does, yep. Do you say when opening the crate, like for one and twos, where you can walk along the concrete, like actually open the door on the concrete wall side to let them out? Yeah, if you, well, it's different now because now there are dogs on each side. Oh, there are. Yep. So, yeah, so they have, they have, Put the guillotine down in rooms one and two, and there are now dogs on both sides. Okay. When, yeah, that's okay. So, yeah, so in the instance where you have a, a guillotine style kennel where there are two separate sides to it and the guillotine is open, it is oftentimes preferable to, to leash the dog on the far side. And that is generally just because you're, you're going to minimize the amount of stress that they're going through as you kind of walk them through the main area to go outside. It also is nice, especially in rooms one and two, because during hours that the public comes in and is looking at adoptable dogs, you, you don't want to have a stressed, bouncy dog making a bad impression, um, you know, as you're just trying to get them outside. They just got poop, you know, they're going to be bouncing off the walls. It's fine. Um, so yeah, so if you can, but right now, yeah, right now they've, they've uh, guillotined them. I, I, you know, the shelter's really full, so. I get it. Does everyone know what I'm talking about with the guillotine style kennel? There's two sides, okay. Um, and then sometimes there are only one side and they use half and half. Um, all right, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Actually, I usually have the issue of the kennel with, they're so excited because they want to get up, they got to get up. Yeah. They're just digging at my feet when I have that stance, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I, yeah. I, yeah, but I'm trying to like do the perfect amount just to get their head and I always get yeah. hurt because they're, they're poor. Yeah, and, of course, yeah. And, to let them cool down because you know it's just gonna keep stressing them out. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Is there any and they're not responding to treats, right? Right, totally. They're on there like, no, I need to get out. Yeah. Is yeah. there any other tactic you can use? Yeah, so a couple, and you might have to try a couple different things depending on the dog, depending on the dog's height, depending on their age, right? Younger dogs are more flexible and sure they can get those paws like they can be like, you know, get their paws right up above their head and put them through the through the leash instead, right? Versus like an older dog or a or more stout squatty dog. Um so you can go higher, you can go higher up and literally just try and tap, like grab their nose in it can be helpful, right? Because if they're just, if they're just getting their nose and then you're quick enough to like release it so that it closes around them, more likely than not their momentum is forward, you're going to leash them around the neck. Um, does everyone understand what I'm saying there? To avoid grasping the paws for a very jumpy, bouncy dog. If you try a couple times to have them leash themselves and they keep sticking their paws in the leash itself, you could elevate the height of the leash and you can additionally lure with a treat. With the elevation, lure, like attach that treat to their nose if they're taking treats. Mm -hmm. Sometimes even if they're not taking treats, the lure is interesting enough. Like it's like, cause it's your hand. And I would only recommend this with dogs that are not a very clear and present bite risk. But in this example, you're talking about a dog that is overstimulated, very excited, very friendly, but on the jumpier side, correct? So lure with a treat if they are able to take treats and are stimulated by treats, elevate the height so you're getting the nose. And then once the nose goes in, they're already moving forward because they're trying to get out, move the treat back and close it. Um, is one way to do it. You could also do the same thing that you suggested, which is sort of swap over to a different dog. But I would give the first dog something to do in the meantime. I would give them kind of like, I would grab a, a Kong and stuff it with peanut butter, like lick mat, Frisbee, put some peanut butter on it, have them lick it through the outside of the kennel. Do you guys know where these things are, by the way? Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, and, and they move around a lot. so. Frisbees are generally in the hallway that's between dog isolation and dog holding. There's a big, like 50 gallon barrel that has a bunch of Frisbees in it with carabiners on it. So you can actually paint the inside of the Frisbee, which is in the room that is 
the re refrigeration room where there's all the dog food and um, that, that's where peanut butter is also. And grab a spoon out of the dishwashing room, which is directly beside the refrigeration room and paint the Frisbee with some peanut butter. And the reason that you would do that is if you kind of just leave them there, they might just get more and more amped, especially if they're seeing other dogs go by. I could see a situation where they're just getting, they're kind of just hyping themselves up. They're, is it my turn? Is it my turn? You know, and then they, you might go back to leash them and it's the same challenge. But if you give them something to lick, licking is a calming behavior. Licking is actually something that can be found to decrease a dog's stress levels and also get them to breathe because when they're licking, they have to breathe. One of the main challenges with very stressed dogs is they're, they're not actually really breathing through their nose. They're not smelling. So licking, they're using their mouth so they're forced to stop barking and then also breathe through their nose so it decreases their stress levels a lot. So stuffed Kong or um, painted Frisbee, attach it to the outside of the kennel. If you're just really having a hard time, if you're just like, gosh, this dog, I just keeps putting his paws in there, you know, try that and then move on to a different dog wait till they finish and then come back and see if you can use one of those strategies, maybe with a higher lead to, to leash them. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, totally. We'll walk, we'll, we'll walk through um, after this class portion. Um, if they're anything but fearful and shy, stand to leash them. You don't have to crouch for a dog that is jumpy. Um, I would recommend not doing that because they're going to be way faster than you are in standing up. <laughs> and they're going to have a lot more leverage from the inside of the kennel pushing out on the door. Um, your ability to maintain that foot pressure is going to be really, it's going to be really tough. Uh, move quickly to go outside as I demonstrated. Call out when you're opening the door and entering the hallway. I tried to make these little like, I don't know, these little infographic type things in here. I had this idea that people might want to like, put them on their fridge or like, I don't know, cut them out. You don't have to do that unless you're corny like me and you want your fridge to have dog stuff on it as a reminder, but they're there if you want it. Um, solutions to common challenges with shelter dogs. We've gone over a lot of this stuff already, but here's some more stuff. The harness lead. This is really helpful with dogs that are a flight risk. Dogs that are a genuine flight risk and it's already indicated on their kennel, it is probably the safest option to put the harness lead, you got it, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, to put the harness lead on the dog in the kennel because you're minimizing any risk that they're gonna slip out. Also huskies, period. Just kidding. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. There is no breed specific material in here except for huskies. Um, but seriously, also huskies, yeah. Um, Otherwise, with dogs that are short snout, um, with dogs that they might just be pulling really hard, maybe they're big, beefy, muscular dogs, they're just like, you know, they don't even notice you're on the other end of the leash, they're just taken off. Um, take them over to a kennel. I like the gravel kennels behind restricted because they're, they're very quiet, there's like no one out there. Um, go ahead and drop the lead, drop the end of the lead. They still have this around their neck and then I like to do a consent test before I put a harness on a dog. The reason that I like to do a consent test is just because they let you leash them up and walk them outside does not mean that they're comfortable being touched. And it also doesn't mean that they're comfortable being touched everywhere. The reason that I say that is some dogs might have pain, right? We've had dogs here that have been hit by cars, you know, um, and brought in by someone that found them on the side of the road. They might have an injury physically that we don't know about. And touching that injury might make them feel a lot of pain, which might make them try and bite you to get out of that pain, right? It's not likely, but it can happen. And we want to account for the rare instance just so everyone stays safe. So the consent test is the following. They have the, they have the um, leash around their neck. You've dropped the other side of it. And I like to crouch because, again, it, it reduces your physical presence. The, oh, sorry, and this is terrible. I'm a terrible person to get videoed, aren't I? Because I just move around. Oh, <laughs> oh, really? Oh my goodness, okay. Um, the alternative is there are benches in those gravel kennels. You can actually just take a seat on the bench and that also reduces your physical presence. 
um, with a very jumpy dog that's <laughs> in your face, don't sit down and don't give them the opportunity to continue to practice jumping in your face. You can stand for this one. The consent test is the following. The dog is in the leash and you're gonna reach toward them, observe their behavior as you reach, which means that if they give you whale eye when you stick your hand out, do not continue sticking your hand out. Whale eye means that you can see all of the whites of their eyes, and it basically is the equivalent of someone going like this. My eyes don't open very wide, but you get the picture, right? Um, as you place your hand on the dog's chest, observe them. Are they leaning into it? Are they going, oh yeah, I feel so good, I want a pet? Or are they like, are they freezing? Are they holding their breath? Are they saying, I really wish this wasn't happening to me? If it's the first instance, give them a pet. Go ahead, you know, if they're leaning in, if they're saying, oh, this is so great, I've been waiting for this, I've been in my kennel, go ahead and pet them, give them a nice rub down. You are introducing physical touch to them in a safe way, they have said okay, they have leaned into you. You know, they're, they're, they've got loose eyelids, they've got loose floppy ears, they have a loose wiggly butt, great. Awesome, proceed with touch, go ahead and pet them. Then the harness, uh, or the, the ring at the back of the harness goes on the back of their neck. This part goes right underneath their arms, right underneath their armpits. And then the loose end that you have already dropped goes directly through this loop here. We're gonna practice on actual dogs I wasn't allowed to bring a dog in here today, but we'll practice on actual dogs later. Um, then it makes a nice harness for you. The harness leads are designed to be extra long. So once you do make the harness, you still have a normal leash length between you and the dog versus a traditional shorter leash where you, you physically can't do it without being like right up on the dog. Um, if the dog is fearful, shrink, shrinking back, I just smacked my microphone. If the dog is <laughs> fearful or shrinking back from you, um, take your time with that dog. Maybe you don't need to put a harness lead on them. Maybe they're still a flight risk, but maybe you're gonna spend a lot more time in that gravel run where they are now safely enclosed with the doors closed and just hang out and sort of wait and see if that behavior changes. See if they get a little looser, a little waggier. Um, and so that you can proceed to the next step. The next stage of the consent test with a dog that sort of stays still, but isn't necessarily leaning into you or backing up is kind of in between, is to then, you know, progress it to a little pet and then remove your hand. And everyone forgets this step, but removing your hand is a really cool opportunity because it gives the dog the, the confidence of making a choice, right? You're not forcing anything. They can come to you if they're like, well, that was kind of nice. I think, uh, yeah, I'm into this, what we're doing here. If they back off and go to the other side of the kennel, allow them to do that. Respect their, op their, their autonomy of choice, respect the fact that they're saying, eh, I allowed you to pet my chest, but like, that's about it. I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe they haven't, maybe they were kept in a kennel outside for four years before they found, you know, the shelter. Maybe they're not familiar with physical human touch. We don't know their background and we're not gonna assume that touch is a comforting thing for every dog because it definitely is not. Um, and it definitely is not for all dogs at all times. Um, if the dog continues to evade touch, don't force it. The only other time you have to physically touch them, which is like not even really a touch, is to leash them up and go back in the kennel. And if you feel any lack of confidence in leashing them back up, do not take them off of the leash in the first place. You know, if you feel like this dog is, really not enjoying being close to me or my physical touch or my presence, keep the leash on them, take them on a walk kind of wherever they wanna go, and then that's it. Bring them back to their kennel. Um, you don't have to initiate play, you don't have to initiate physical contact. A lot of times we sort of assume that play with toys or lots of pets are relaxing to dogs um, and recognizing that that's not the case for every single dog, especially a dog in a really high level of stress, is gonna be important because we have to meet them where they're at. If we meet them where they're at, they're gonna allow for us to do a lot more. They're gonna allow for an adopter who might not have the same level of behavioral experience as we do to have a really positive interaction with them 
in the future. And that's the goal. Um, secondarily, solutions to common challenges with shelter dogs. Safe play with toys. Um, I like to have a two toy system. I like to have like one toy tucked in my um, like fanny pack um, or in my like the waistband of my pants for the purpose of trading toys with dogs. If I need to get a toy back from a dog, um, I prefer to trade as opposed to reaching in and grabbing it because in a space with very limited resources, resource guarding is an understandable and very common response. It is a great way to get your hand bit if you stick your hand in to grab a toy that a dog wants. Even if your intention was, I'm just gonna throw it again and then you go get it. Doesn't matter, they don't know. All they know is I've been here three weeks, this is the first time I've seen this awesome toy and it's great and I do not want you to take it, right? Understandable. Say play with toys, keep two toys near you. When they finish playing with one or bring one back to you, trade them for the other toy. So fetch doesn't always have to be with the same ball over and over and over again. It could be you bring this one back to me, great, I hand you this ball and you're gonna drop the first one and I'm gonna take that, right? Um, never grab a toy out from between their paws or out of their mouth. This is in bold because it's important. If they want to keep the toy, let them hold on to it. If they are giving you any sign that they do not want to let the toy go, it's fine. We will figure it out. It is much worse if you try and take the toy than if you let them keep it, even if it's a tennis ball that they're not supposed to have back in their kennel, right? You can, there's a thousand toys here you can try and swap them with. You can try and swap them with a treat. You can bring them back to the, uh, the refrigeration room, give them a spoonful of peanut butter and ask them to trade you for a spoonful of peanut butter. Um, I carry string cheese with me, which is generally a high, high value resource for most dogs. Um, you know, pull out your string cheese. It's really also, also a really cheap treat. Um, pull out your string cheese and see if they'll, you know, oh, would you like, would you like some string cheese instead? And then instead of reaching for the ball, kick it away from you, right? So that way you can quickly move your foot. The ball is gone. They don't have to see it anymore. String cheese, string cheese. Um, Never lift the toy up out of their reach. I see people do this all the time. <laughs> if you do it once, you're gonna recognize you never wanna do it again. Because there will always be that instance of the dog using you like a human wall and just running up your chest. You've seen the dogs do this, the dogs do this in agility training, right? They can physically run up your body and get this toy. No matter how tall you are, they can get up there. This is not keeping it away from them. Also, like, why? You know, you don't need to get it away from them, it's fine. If they wanna hold on to it, if they don't wanna play fetch and instead they wanna play destroy the ball that you just gave them, honestly, fine, let them have it. Um, recognize the signs of overstimulation. Yeah, this is an important one no matter what you're doing with the dog. If they're excessively jumpy, excessively mouthy, right? I'm not talking about bites, I'm talking about mouthing your body with their mouth, or mouthing your hands with their mouth, mouthing your clothing with their mouth, mouthing your treat pouch with their mouth. If they're excessively mouthy, it's a sign of stress. Um, if they're excessively humpy, if you, I, I, humpy is not a sexual behavior. Humpy is a behavior that is oftentimes trying to shake off stress in any way that they know how. Um, and it is a natural behavior, but it's annoying, and we don't want to encourage it but those are signs of overstimulation. If you recognize the signs of excessive jumpiness, as in, I can't stop, I'm just jumping, there's no rhyme, no reason, I'm just like a pogo stick, excessively mouthy uh, or humpy, it's time to switch your perspective, to switch the game. The game is overstimulating, right? Or maybe you were running with the dog back and forth and they just got too hype, kind of like a little kid. It's like, you change the environment. Leash them up, take them over to the trees, do a nice snippy walk take a handful of treats, scatter them on the ground, see if they'll go sniff, because again, sniffing is access to breathing, it's access to calming, it's gonna bring them down out of it. So on the next page, minimally intense games, find it with treats or toys, this is a great way to sort of redirect that overstimulated behavior if it is present, if you're noticing excessive jumpiness, excessive mouthiness, uh, humping, leash biting, um, excessive pulling, these are great games to play. Find it with treats or toys. Find it can be as simple as I'm gonna show them I have a treat in my hand and I'm gonna 
drop it on the ground in front of them and I encourage them to find it. You have to start very simple with overstimulated dogs um, as oftentimes their mental focus will not be there. So don't go find it and then expect them to be able to follow visually and scent wise what you just tossed. Um, but potentially even luring their nose down to the ground is helpful. It redirects their mental focus. It allows for them to start breathing as they're smelling with treats um, or with a toy. If they're not super treat motivated, if they're not really, you know, attaching to the treats there, grab some toys and maybe you're just kind of tossing the toy over there and then saying, find it, find it, and then really rewarding them in a very exaggerated way with lots of praise when they bring it back to you or when they do find it. And then you could use your second toy to then toss over there and find it, oh yay, yay, and grab the first toy again and you can keep going with this game. It seems really dumb and it seems really simple, but again, it's sort of showing them a way that they can redirect their focus without jumping, mouthing, humping, leash biting, whatever it is that they were trying to do originally. Um, a sniffari in the tall grass, oftentimes you don't even need treats or toys for this. The, the, the nature scents are just enough. There are, on the tree line, just behind the big run out in this field here, and then also, of course, in the tree line back here, there are tons of deer out there all the time. You guys, if you ever come and walk dogs at dusk, tons of deer and geese, all kinds of wildlife. So there's so many smells they can just go and like, be a dog, just go sniff around, be a dog. Um, that can be really relaxing for them. It could also be super stimulating for dogs that might, you know, really like deer or geese or something like that. So you might have to have a redirection from the sniffari if it has the opposite impact that you want. Again, it is going to be dog dependent. It's not, you're not gonna be able to know until you try it. So these, I'm giving you lots of options. You can have them pr pr practice their commands or cues on command. This can be really helpful for dogs that you know, have had a previous experience of living in a home, um, owner surrenders that are coming in that have been house trained and no sit down, paw, all that kind of stuff. It can help really build their confidence to go through this litany of skills. It might seem really silly, but it can help them focus and adopters like it. It doesn't really make a difference whether or not the dog sits, but adopters really like it if the dog knows sit. It's just a thing. Um, and then lastly, change your location for new smells and new stimulus. If you have a dog that's very hyper, that's overstimulated, change the location. If you're out here in the big run, take them for a sniff walk over here behind the gravel runs. If you're over here and that sniff walk turned into a let's go hunting all the squirrels, then maybe maybe you want to bring them back in here in the pot, in the parking lot and try and do a little find it with the treats. You know, have some options so that you can try your best to give each dog the best experience that you possibly can and don't give up at the same at the moment that you say this dog is really jumpy really mouthy there are options to help you deal with that right um jumpy dogs we discussed this multiple times junky jumpy dogs are often over aroused they're trying to get attention um and don't know how or a combination of both um yeah, understanding what causes continually jumpy be behavior helps to solve it, as telling an over-aroused dog off does nothing. Um, but helping them calm, helping them sniff, helping them tune into their environment can do a whole lot. Uh, yeah. Oh, lastly, don't lean or cower over a jump, jumpy dog. This is, you know, just common sense. But if you've seen them jump up before <laughs> and you do this, um, they will hit you in the chin and it will hurt. Um, yeah. Next page, leash biting. Leash biting is frustrating when it happens, um, but it's a sign of over arousal, just like jumping. Um, there are obviously levels to this over arousal and everyone here has the ability to sort of, you know, say no if it's too much. If you know a dog is a leash biter, you had a really hard time with walking them last time, you don't have to walk them again, okay? Um, but these are strategies for helping you deal with it if a dog, especially a young dog, especially a teenage age dog, gets over aroused and starts, le starts leash biting. Um, so if they're leashed, pull up on the leash, not to choke them out, do not choke them out. It will just freak them out and cause them to panic, especially if they're in a state of over arousal, but to give them less to bite. Pull up here, it makes it harder for them to twist their mouth around to grab this, right? Um, 
get your hand out of the way. It also keeps your hand out of the way because if, you know, they're at some point they're going to get your hand. You don't want it to happen, but at some point they will. Um, so that makes it harder. Change locations as quickly as possible. Get them out of where they were. Introduce something else, new smells, whatever you can do to try and get their attention. While you're pulling up on the leash with this hand, and try and keep this out of the way, with this hand, introduce another toy for them to grab and bite or treats, and you can cup your hand because if they're getting really mouthy on the leash, they might get really mouthy on your hand, right? Cup your hand, make like a like you would feed a horse. I don't know if you guys have ever fed horses. Yeah, so like you'd feed a horse, put it like that in your cupped hand and literally like move them over to another place while their mouth is here. More often than not, they're gonna forget that the leash was fun because when you stop pulling back on the leash with a leash biter, it stops becoming an attractive game. If you continue to pull on the leash, you are then in a game of tug with a dog who's very invested in the game of tug. And this is your tugging toy, and we don't really want that. Um, continue trying to offer the trade. If they don't take it right away, use, <laughs> this seems super silly, but use a really excited voice to tell them how excited you are about the, about the toy that you have in your other hand. Sometimes that just makes it a game. Sometimes that makes it enough. Oh my gosh, look at this, this toy! Look at this toy! Look at this toy! Oh my God, like, I'm just gonna, you know, whatever. I'm just gonna grab that toy to make you shut up, right? Like, is it, whatever it does, it redirects their attention to the other thing that you have, which is the most valuable thing. Um, yeah, most of the time the fun of the leash is you tugging back, so don't play that game. If you have to, move to one of the enclosed runs, drop the leash, and as soon as you drop the leash, 99% of the time, the dog will lose interest immediately because it is no longer a game. Yes, they will run around with your leash on, and yes, it will get poop on it, but yes, you were planning on washing it anyways after the, the walk session, so it's fine. Um, fear and timidity. Timid and fearful dogs often warm up with time, space away from the shelter noises, and the knowledge that you won't push past their comfort level. If I could reiterate, every anything throughout this entire course, it's that, I know, I apologize for repeating myself, but that is really important. Do not push past a dog's comfort level if they're communicating with you on a basic level, as outlined by the body language on the first page. If they're communicating with you on a very basic level that they are uncomfortable, do not make them say it louder by aggressing, growling, mouthing, nipping, biting, because um, they've already told you. Uh, if a timid dog is demonstrating tuck tail, crouch body language, stiffness, stillness, lip licking, ears back, et cetera, give them lots of space. You don't have to pet them. You don't have to reach toward them, even with a treat or cower over them. Allow timid and fearful dogs to determine their own walk path, distance, and duration as long as they're in safe areas. This is something that's kind of cool. It's a really easy way to actually communicate to a timid dog that they have a level of aut autonomy. Dogs don't have autonomy here. Autonomy is the ability to say, I'd rather sleep on the couch instead of the dog bed today. Or I'd rather go out to the backyard and bark at the squirrels today, like our dogs have at home. These dogs have scheduled meals, literally four walls that they're staring at that are exactly the same every single time until someone comes in and cleans their kennel. And then that's a super exciting event for like five seconds. Um, and that's it, they don't have any autonomy. So if you allow them to choose their own walk path, that can help them to develop a level of confidence that does benefit them by minimizing their stress. It seems like such a simple thing, but if they wanna go that way, and you're like, no, we're gonna walk over here, we're gonna go to the run, or we're, I had this plan for us, just drop the expectations, let them go where they wanna go. If they wanna go in a more quiet area, fine. If they wanna go sniff the parking lot or a single blade of grass for 10 minutes, even though it seems super boring, Maybe there's a really interesting smell there, and maybe that's really important to them for that moment. That's fine. Um, for significantly fearful dogs, we went over this before, instead of feeding them treats directly, toss treats to them. You don't even have to toss treats to them, especially with very fearful dogs. Sometimes a treat coming at your head might even seem more threatening. You can literally just toss treats like over there, whatever it is, as long as it's not making them come towards scary you or something else that they perceive as scary. You could just toss it over there in the grass and allow them to, you know, get those treats on their own 
timeline. Um, when a timid dog approaches you, they're not always asking for pets. This is important. This is going back to page two. Um, are they happy or are they shut down? When a timid dog approaches you, oftentimes they're checking you out. They're trying to find out some more information. They're smelling you, yes, but like they can smell you from a distance because our sense of smell is so infinitely far beyond our sense of smell that, you know, they smelled you before you came into the building, right? So they're gonna be checking you out. They're kind of gonna also be testing you a little bit, like in a way. They wanna see, do you reach toward them? Are you gonna grab them by the collar as someone maybe did in the past? Are you gonna rough them up a little bit? Are you just gonna be still? Are you gonna let them inspect? It's important to just let them sniff and not instinctively try and pet. Even though you want to, just let them sniff. If they're coming to you and you're just hanging out, just staying still, just let them do it. Um, you can, if you feel comfortable, you know, moving, they're indicating their body language is a little bit more relaxed now that they're sniffing. They're like, okay, this person is okay. You can grab treats out of your pouch and sort of scatter them on the ground around you. Don't hand them directly to a very shy or very fearful dog but you can just drop them on the ground and just say, okay, great, this is your reward for coming near me. This is, I'm a person who, when you come near me, I produce great things and they taste like chicken, you know? Um, just move really slowly with them. Move slowly is oftentimes stated with fearful dogs and it means so many different things. It means physically move slowly. It also means progress your time with them slowly. Don't force them to move right into, oh, I'm gonna take your leash off now. Maybe you don't have to take the leash off, you know, take their slip lead off as soon as you get in the run. Um, maybe you just wanna leave it on for a little bit if they're showing discomfort with your hand reaching toward them. Again, the discomfort looks like lip licks, it looks like whale eye, it looks like body weight shifted away from you. Um, it looks potentially like fur raised, it looks like ears sort of changing positions with some dogs, they'll go out wide. If they're uncertain, some dogs might go straight up if they're uncertain. Um, sick dogs. Uh, we've all seen this. If the dog you're walking is visibly coughing, has a runny nose, et cetera, submit a medical slip for them. If they already have medication in the plastic envelope in their kennel, there's a good chance they're already being treated, but new symptoms might have developed and you might be the first person noticing it. So it is actually imperative to fill out a medical slip for dogs, even if they already have medication hanging on their kennel. Um, and you place it in the file folder outside of the treatment room. We will visit treatment if it's just so everyone sort of has an idea of where it is. Reporting behavior. Um, this is anything that you feel like is a little, might be challenging for a prospective adopter or volunteer, and this is relevant. Uh, there are pink behavior slips in the clear plastic folder in the back of the doors to the rooms, sometimes. Sometimes those behavior slips are white, sometimes they aren't there. Um, if they're there, you can fill those out and stick the slip in the cage card holder. I like to put it on the back of the cage card holder, especially if they're in an adoptable room, unless it's super nice behavior, and then I put it in the front. So, you know, either way, yeah, either way it goes in the cage card holder if it's maybe some challenging behavior, something that's not necessarily prohibitive for an adopter, but something that you, you wanna make sure gets noted in their file, as in this is a, you know, this dog's a leash biter, and you know, maybe it's better to take them on a cal calmer walk next time. You can indicate that, but put it on the back. Um, I also, I sent a note to Marilyn uh, by email after I walked the dogs, um, if there's anything specific in terms of behavior. Um, I separate my notes by two categories. I'll write a little bio for them. Volunteers, I don't know if you guys have noticed, volunteers are the only people that write bios for the dogs. So when a potential adopter logs onto the website at 24 Pet Connect, the bios that they're seeing for the dogs are volunteers that vol volunteers have written. The adoption coordinators do not write bios for the dogs. The rescue coordinators don't write bios for the dogs. It's exclusively volunteers. I hope that does change at some point in the future because it's a lot of work to put on volunteers, but it does mean that the time that you spend with the dogs is super valuable 
in getting them adopted. I think the recent research is something like 90% of adopters find their dog online and like come in with a specific A number of a dog they want to meet. The reason that they saw that dog is because they saw one of James's pictures, <laughs> right? Or one of the other photographers and volunteers here. Um, and a bio. Like a lot of times, you know, someone says, gosh, this dog was so lovely to spend time with. I wish I could spend some more time with them. Someone reads that, that sounds fantastic, right? So write a genuine and honest bio for them. Even if it's two sentences, try and capture a picture of your time together. Submit that to Marilyn, whether you're putting it on the behavior slip or whether you're putting it in email afterwards. Then you can also indicate on a separate line, behavior note. Anything that would be concerning. This dog is ex excessively jumpy. This dog is da 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 that's, that's a separate line item. And I would put that separate because anything that you put in bio is gonna be put on 24 Pet Connect for a prospective adopter to see. If you want them to see something, like I very recently walked a dog who was excessively humpy to the point where he could not be redirected. Um, and I did include that in his bio and I said, you know, this dog would not be suitable for a home with children, right? That's, that's fine, that's a, genuine, that's a genuine statement. You're not doing anything wrong about the dog. You know? You're not doing wrong by them. It's, it's true, right? Um, so it goes both ways. If you want something to be put in their bio, if you wanna report accurately on your time with the dog, then, uh, then put it in that bio. All right, do you guys have questions on this part of the class? I know everyone's, everyone's like yawning at me, it's so hot in here. I'm, it's really warm. 